Good morning, friends, and welcome once again to Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Seventh Avenue Church in Sacramento, California. Very warm welcome to our online members and also those who are joining us on the various networks across the country and around the world. Thank you for tuning in to study our lesson with us today. Also the members and the visitors, as always here at Granite Bay, very warm welcome to all of you. Now, as many of you know, we've started a brand new lesson quarterly entitled Oneness in Christ. And today we're going to launch into our first study, which is entitled Creation and the Fall. Now, I know many of you have your lesson quarterly. If you don't have a lesson quarterly, you'll be able to receive one following the church today. Just ask for it. One of our church hosts will be able to get that for you. And for those who are viewing online, if you don't have a copy of today's lesson and you'd like to have one in your hand that you can study along, all you'll need to do is just visit the following website at study.aftv.org and you'll be able to download this week's lesson. That website again is study.aftv.org to download a copy of the lesson for today. And then we also have a free offer we'd like to let those who are watching the program know about. It is a DVD sermon by Pastor Doug Batchelor entitled Holiness and Purity. And this is our free offer to anyone who will call and ask for it. The number to call is 866-788-3966 and ask for offer number 857 you can also download a digital version of the sermon. You can have it right there on your phone or your computer. In order to do so, you need to text the following code, SH110, to the number 40544. And then you'll receive a link where you'll be able to download for free a digital version of the sermon by Pastor Doug entitled Holiness and Purity. Well, before we get to our lesson this morning, we always like to begin by lifting our voices in song. I'm going to invite our choruses to come and they'll lead us in our song this morning. Thank you so much for joining with us. And at this time, Pastor Ross will have our opening prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in your house and study your word. And as we launch into this new series of lessons, we do ask in a special way that the Holy Spirit would guide our hearts and our minds. Father, we know that it's your desire that we be united in you. And so guide us as we explore this important theme. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're very delighted to have a church here at Granite Bay with many talented individuals. One of our elders here at the Granite Bay Church is Dr. David DeRose. He's not a stranger to our Sabbath School audience and those of you here in person. And we're just delighted that he's willing to come and share with us. So he'll be teaching our lesson today. So thank you, Dr. DeRose. 
You know, there are many great themes in the Bible. And perhaps one of the greatest is one that really describes the entire Bible. It's sometimes called the theme of restoration or the plan of restoration. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of Acts. There is the story of Peter and John entering the temple. There is a man there greatly in need of healing. And God ministers through his two apostles. And Peter then has an audience, and he begins to preach there in Acts chapter 3. And he mentions, beginning with verse 19, a pivotal verse that I believe sets the stage for where we're headed this quarter and where we're going today. Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 19, the words of Peter, "'Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His prophets, all His holy prophets,' since the world began. Did you catch it there in Peter's preaching? There is a theme that runs through the entire Bible, at least as Peter spoke about it under inspiration. He said that God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began about what? That's right, the times of restoration of all things. And so as we begin the quarter, as we begin this theme on oneness in Christ, we want to look and focus in on this theme of restoration because we're introduced at the beginning of this series to the creation. It's just where the Bible starts, isn't it? If you think about it, if you've never looked at it that way, the Bible starts two chapters describing the original perfect creation. We're going to look at that in some detail. But if you missed some of the details of the original perfect creation, the last two chapters of the Bible speak about what? That's right, the restoration or the recreation of those very same things that were made originally in the beginning by our loving Creator. So let's look at the focus in the first couple of lessons there. Actually, it's lesson one, the couple uh, readings there for Sabbath and Sunday if you were going through the lesson quarterly. And you see first as it begins, it mentions here on the very first paragraph commenting on this series, it says, any attempt at understanding the nature of unity in the church must begin with God's original plan at the creation and then the need for restoration after the fall. So with that in mind, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And in Sunday's lesson, it has us focus on a descriptor that God used, an adjective, to describe how His creation was. In Genesis 1.31, if you'd been reading through Genesis 1, of course, we don't have time to do it together today, but if you're reading through Genesis 1, you'd read, it was good, it was good. At the end of each of the days of creation, just about every one, it has that mentioned. But then, at the end of the sixth day of creation, Verse 31, it says, God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was what? Very good. So a summary of God's original creation is that it was very good. Everything that God made was very good. And it's interesting, as you look in detail at what God made, it brings us to this subject of unity very quickly. In fact, many scholars have pointed out the very name of God used in Genesis 1 Elohim is a plural name for God. Other times in the Old Testament, we read that term often translated Jehovah or Yahweh. But uh, here in Genesis 1, it's this plural term, Elohim. And so it is, as you're reading through Genesis 1, you come to a work that is done by God in plurality. That's right. That's how the Hebrew reads. In Genesis 1, verse 26 we read those words, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And so it's quite interesting, isn't it? That God, when he wants to create in his own image, he doesn't create a single being, he creates in plurality. And so from the very beginning of Scripture, we have this sense that God, although one, is a plurality. And I know we struggle with this concept, often referred to as the Trinity, but as a biblical term. And we often speak biblical term not because that word Trinity appears, but because the concept appears. In very, the very beginning, look at verse 1, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God, this God described by a plural noun, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and deepness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved in that original creation, and so they create in plurality. Now some, as they look at that, they say, yes, it's obvious it's plural, but Dr. DeRose, there are only two, Adam and Eve, who are created. So it must just be the Father and the Son that were involved. Maybe there isn't even a Holy Spirit. You know, it's very interesting how the Godhead refers to itself. Have you ever thought about this? The Godhead never calls attention. Any person in the Godhead, Jesus never calls attention to himself. Who is he always pointing to? The Father. Who does the Father honor? Jesus, right? Who does the the Spirit point to? Points to the Father and the Son. It's this very interesting relationship in these members of the Godhead. In fact, if you study this out through history, even the angels misunderstood the nature of the Godhead. Jesus, throughout history, has always been stepping down to the level of his creation. You following along with me? Jesus is, in the Old Testament, often referred to, even in the New, as Michael the archangel. As you study the Scriptures, it seems that even the angels misunderstood Jesus to be an angel at one point. And when he came to this earth, Jesus was misrecognized as what? As humanity. And the Holy Spirit, often shrouded in some mystery, has often been relegated to just an essence. But the personhood of the Holy Spirit, we studied about it as for a whole quarter. And yet many in Christianity still struggle with this. But I'd like to suggest to you that even in the vernacular, we understand something about unity that comes to us as we look at the very beginning of creation. How many of you have heard the expression, two's company, but three's a crowd? What's that referring to? I mean, sometimes there's a connotation of some, you know, intimate dialogue or something. But actually, we don't have too much of a problem thinking about two people, two closely united people being in harmony. But when you bring three people into harmony, this truly is remarkable. And as we're speaking about oneness, and as we're speaking about the creation, I don't think we can escape realizing who the Creator is that the Godhead in its fullness created humanity. And humanity in its fullness does not include just Adam and Eve. Do you notice from the very beginning, what was the plan of the Godhead in creating? Do you catch it there in Genesis 1 and 2? Was it the plan that just Adam and Eve would be united as two individuals? What were they tasked with doing? With multiplying, right? They were given dominion, a loving rule over the earth, but they were to multiply. It's a very, very interesting concept, and I encourage you to ponder that because really I believe the foundation for unity is seen in the Godhead itself. You know, there was a famous poet, no disrespect to him, who said God created because he was lonely. But I would like to suggest to you the amazing thing about the creation is that God created out of the fullness that was in the Godhead. Three people, perfectly united, perfectly content, but wanting to share that love with us, with angelic beings, with creation. Well, this lesson on Sunday 
points us to something else about that original creation, and it comes from 1 John chapter 4. It speaks about God creating in his own image, and it's really asking us to ponder a little bit more about what that image involves. And so as John, that disciple who had a special relationship with Jesus, wrote his first epistle, his letter there found in the Bible, not in the Gospel of John, but in 1 John chapter 4, John describes the character of God in a way that has often been quoted. 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. It's, excuse me, beginning with verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is what? God is love. We've heard that many times, right? That simple, succinct description of God's character. He is what? Love. God is love. And so when God creates in his image, it's not just with some physical bearing, having some relationship physically to God, but it's also character. So just as God creates in plurality, creates for oneness, creates for unity, he creates with that essence that is necessary for unity. And what is it? What essence? What do we have to have to be united? Love, right? So God's character is love. He creates loving creatures with the capacity to love each other. Now, it was not just enough for God to create. God wanted to be intimately involved with his creation. We're going to look in just a moment at a scripture found in Revelation 21. We have someone who will be reading that for us in just a minute from Revelation 21, verses 3 to 5. But I want to observe something for you. God did not just wind up this world and put it in motion. You know, there's a philosophy, a, a view of the world, a cosmology that's called deism. And the idea is that God is the divine clockmaker, that he just wound up the clock on creation and let things run. No, that's not the picture that we get as we read the Bible. In fact, as you read through Genesis 1, 2, and 3, it becomes readily apparent that God was physically present with Adam and Eve. Have you picked up on that? If you don't catch it in Genesis 1 and 2, well, you say, well, God formed Adam from the dust of the earth. He, he had to be physically present there, but that there was an ongoing physical contact Ongoing physical contact, you find it there in Genesis chapter 3. You find evidence there. We'll find other evidence in the recreation in just a moment. But look at Genesis 3. After sin, and we'll talk about the fall in just a few minutes, but after the fall, it says in Genesis 3, verse 8, they, referring to Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, let me ask you, let's ask you a question. Do you hide yourself from a spirit? Would that make any sense? If God was just some essence, would you hide? No, you'd say an essence is always there. God was not as an essence interacting with Adam and Eve. He physically came and dwelt with them. They physically interacted with God. And so we know that right there in Genesis 3, we see this picture of Adam and Eve no longer enjoying communion with the Godhead. We'll get there in a minute. Let's go to Genesis 21, excuse me, Revelation 21, because we want to take another glimpse. Remember, we're talking about the plan of restoration. What God had in the beginning, he will have in the end. In, Gen in Genesis, we see God's original creation, Revelation 21. Let's look at the picture of the recreation there. Revelation 21, 3 through 5. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. It's a beautiful passage, isn't it? God is making all things what? 
new. He's restoring. He's recreating. And when he recreates, where is God to be found? In the physical presence of of his people. So just like it was in the beginning, God is recreating. God is recreating. In Gen- excuse me, in Revelation chapter 22, boy, Genesis, Revelation, running back and forth. I'm having a hard time myself keeping them straight. Revelation chapter 22. If you read there, beginning with verse 3, again, a similar picture. There shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They shall need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So here is this amazing creation. We start in the beginning with a God who just doesn't share life with humanity, but shares his presence. He makes us in his image. He gives us love. He brings us into loving relationships, and he commissions Adam and Eve to share that love with other creatures in plurality. It is this picture of oneness, and it is a picture that God will restore in the end. It is a beautiful story, were it not for the rest of the Bible. No, yes, the rest of the Bible is beautiful, but humanity's response is not as beautiful as God's gift, is it? Because in Monday's lesson, it brings us to what immediately follows in the Bible, and that is the fall. Now, those of you who've studied Genesis 1 through 3 before, no doubt you've struggled with what many have struggled with. We looked at that simple description, that simple verdict passed with unerring accuracy by the Creator that everything was very good in the beginning. But there's a problem, some people say, with what God created. I'm in Genesis 2, and as we're preparing to talk about the fall, we have to bring this into perspective. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, it says, "...the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed." And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Where was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was in the midst of the garden. So there was that tree of life that Adam and Eve had to partake of in order to sustain life. It was a symbol of their trusting relationship with God. But God had endowed that tree with special properties. And yet, in close proximity to that tree, in the center of the garden somewhere, was what? This tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, some have struggled with this because they said, God said that everything was very good. But that tree of the knowledge of good and evil does not seem to be all that very good because we're coming to Genesis 3 and you know what happens at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How could that tree be very good? Have you ever thought about it? Well, having taught in the classroom before, I have perhaps a different perspective on tests than many of you who may have only been students. I, never, I can never recall a student begging for more tests. Now you think it, would, it might not be illogical if someone did poorly on a few tests. Maybe if we had more tests, they could pull their grade up. But I don't ever remember someone coming to me and saying, Dr. DeRose, couldn't we have just a few more tests in this class? I looked over the syllabus, and we only have four exams in the whole semester. You know, a test is not just a way of evaluating people. But a test can actually strengthen the one who takes the test. Have you ever thought about this? You know, if you don't take a test, sometimes you're not as diligent about learning the lessons. Have you ever realized that? We have three children. They all happen to be in college right now. And uh, not uncommonly, we hear about them facing an exam. And somehow those examinations seem to increase their motivation for studying. Can you relate? 
But there's something else that happens when you take a test. It can reinforce the things that you know. Think about it for a minute. Adam and Eve walking through the garden, coming to the tree of life. And as they come to the tree of life, they pass the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What do their senses say about that tree? Well, you'll see as you read through Genesis 3, the tree looked wonderful, right? Just like everything else. But God said what? Not to eat from that tree. So every time they choose not to eat from that tree, what are they doing? Basically, what they're doing is they're not only trusting God, but they're strengthening their relationship to God. They're choosing to honor the one who created them. And by the way, how do, how do you get stronger in the physical realm? Some of, our, of you are not looking at me with great uh, credibility, like maybe I don't know too much about this. You, I don't look like a weightlifter. Whether I do or not, I do know something about how you strengthen muscles. I see it sometimes in patients who've been bedridden. Maybe they uh, had a major surgery. They've been laid up for a long time. What do they have to do in order to regain their strength? They've got to exercise. They've got to use their muscles. So God put in the middle of the garden, a place where Adam and Eve had to strengthen, choose to exercise their faith, their trust, their commitment to him. So it's not a restriction, really, that God put there. You say, well, he did. He said you couldn't eat. But God was giving them an opportunity for blessing and to strengthen their relationship with him. If you have a hard time wrapping your mind around it, I do too. But think about that. But as we come to Monday's lesson, we find that that test, that place that was designed to strengthen relationship, something went terribly wrong. There in Genesis 3, as we read the account, Satan takes the form of the serpent. And it says in Genesis 3, verse 1, as Eve is there apparently alone at the tree, the serpent asks a question. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman immediately enters into converse with Satan. She says, oh, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. And then in verse 4, we have the first lie in the Bible, right? Right? The serpent says to the woman, what? You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here it is. The temptation of Satan is calling Eve to do what? Disobey God? Trust him instead of God? But even more than that. Look at what happens in verse 4. Satan says that you will get blessing, and then what does Eve do in verse 5? Then she, verse 6, she checks it out. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Now, this is quite interesting. How can you tell that a fruit is good to make you wise? You see, Satan tells you a lie, and then you line up some evidence that seems to line up with what Satan's saying, but it is totally irrational. You can't look at a fruit and decide it's going to make you wise, right? That's impossible. But because there is some evidence that it's true, it looks good, this serpent is speaking, he's saying it's good. So you add some evidence now, your sight, and Eve decides to do what? That's right. Eve eats. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. From the very beginning, from the very Garden of Eden, there is a tension. Do you see it? 
Are we going to trust in our loving Creator, or are we going to trust our own senses and what even those in authority around us might say? I mean, who was more authoritative than the serpent in that setting, right? She wasn't hearing God's voice speaking to her. Satan is telling her one thing. It seems to align with her senses. And what does she do? She eats. Someone has a scripture for us just a little bit later in Genesis. In Genesis 3, beginning with verse 11, we start with a picture of unity, perfect harmony, no sin, no death, no suffering. That's where God is trying to bring this planet again. That's where he will bring it. The book of Revelation tells us in Revelation 21 and 22. But in Genesis 3, we see immediate disunity. Genesis 3.11, what does it have to say to us today? And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not, you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman who gave me gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this have you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So what's happening there in that dialogue? Blame, right? Instead of holding people up, instead of affirming one another, what's happening? He did it. She did it. He did it, right? Is this a prescription for unity? Immediately from the beginning of the fall, we see disunity. We see God's original plan is unity. God wants us to be one as he is one. And sin brings disunity and disharmony. But there's more to the story. As is brought out in the, in the lesson here, God has done some interesting things to this point. In fact, I'm going to have you jump, if you have your quarterlies, I'm going to have you jump all the way to Friday's lesson. I want you to pick up on something here because coming into focus in Friday's lesson is something that we skipped over that was part of the original creation because after that summary of creation we read in Genesis 1.31 that everything was very good, we read in Genesis 2, beginning with verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. And what does he do when he rests? It says he not only rests from all his work which he had done, but he blesses the seventh day and sanctifies it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So not only does God give them a place, a physical place in the garden where he will meet with them, God sets aside a day, a place in time, if you will, a palace in time for humanity to meet with him. From the very beginning, there is a blessing on that seventh day. By the way, how many Jews were there in the Garden of Eden? There were none. It was before there was ever a Jew. How many Muslims and Christians were there? Zero. Zero. From the beginning of creation, before there were any denominations, before there were any sects, God's original plan was that all flesh should meet before him there on the Sabbath, this special day that he had set apart. So Friday wants us to have that in perspective as we come to looking at the fall. Because was it true, did death occur when Adam and Eve ate from the tree? Did they die the day they ate? What died? Look at Genesis 3 closely. The death, the first death in the Bible is only implied, but it is quite clear. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, after God pronounces judgment, by the way, in the midst of judgments, God gives the first picture of the gospel. It's there in verse 15. As God is speaking of judgment on the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman 
and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The seed of the woman ultimately is Jesus. Jesus would be bruised by the serpent. The serpent would bruise his heel, but it would not be a life-threatening wound. But the serpent's head would be crushed by the Savior. The promise of the gospel right there in Genesis 3.15. But that, although it foreshadowed Christ's sacrifice, the first death is found a few verses later because Adam and Eve recognized that they were naked after they ate of the tree. Many believe that they were clothed with robes of light and that that light departed after they broke covenant with God, if you will. And in verse 21, it said, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord did what? Made tunics of skin and clothed them. How do you get tunics of skin? You get it from, that's right, the death of an animal. And so the first death, the death that is occasioned by the sin of Adam and Eve is the death of an innocent victim who has to be killed so that Adam and Eve can be clothed with appropriate garments. So in Genesis 3.15, we have a prophecy of Christ's sacrifice, a prophecy of Christ's saving work. But in Genesis 3.21, we have an enacted parable of what Christ will do, that he will clothe us with his robes of righteousness. If we allow God to give us his covering, he will cover our nakedness. He will cover the results of our sin. And it's not because of who we are or what we've done, because of, but because of what he provides. A beautiful picture of the saving God that we have. And so, although the consequences of the fall are disunity, God brings healing in that context. Now, you'd think we could stop right there, but we have to look a little bit more, I believe, at it just appreciating the gospel because there's an interesting dialogue that comes up. Not only is the fall described in Monday's lesson, but also the flood. And before we go there, we're going to have someone read for us from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. But before we do that, let me just set the stage a little bit more because we're, we've been following along, right? God creates perfectly creates in unity, sin comes, brings disunity, but God has a solution from the very beginning. And the solution comes through his provision, not through what we do. Humankind has messed up God's covenant, but God, the faithful covenant-keeping God, provides a son, provides a lamb. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, we get, catch another picture of God's great sacrifice on our behalf. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." So Jesus continues to step down, right? And as our Savior, he comes down as a man and dies for us. But it's interesting, Philippians 2 doesn't stop with that picture, okay? After Jesus dies, Paul, as he's writing under inspiration, he says in verse 9 of Philippians 2, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Multiple times in the Scriptures, in Isaiah, in Romans, we read this expression that every tongue is going to glorify God. When it's all said and done, everyone is going to say, just and true are your ways. You're righteous, God. All your works are righteous. And yet, in Monday's lesson, it speaks of the flood. And many an atheist, many a secularist has said that the flood is, a, is the work of a 
of the worst dictator that's ever been on the planet. If that's true, God is a tyrant. Have you heard claims like that? Imagine you've got a relative and they're going to travel across country, okay? Make a long trip. They're going to move. And as they're checking out the new area they're moving to, they hear about this uh, group of people. You might call them a gang, but that name isn't used. It's, uh, but people are actually in this community. They're knocking people out, and then they're cutting limbs off, arms, legs. I mean, I mean this just sounds sickening, doesn't it? I mean... What do you think your relative would think if they heard they were going to a community where that kind of thing was happening? What would you think? You see, I mean, those people are terrible, aren't they? But now, what if I told you that group of people, they called one of them an anesthesiologist, and another one they called an orthopedic surgeon. And then I told you there were very high rates of diabetes in that community. And they were amputating limbs that had become gangrenous. What would you think? Would you think it was a terrible community? Now, what, what changes it all? When you have full information, something taken out of context that looks terrible can actually be merciful and loving. You see, God only sees from the perspective of eternity. Now, maybe that's too strong. Because, of course, God sees from our human perspective as well. I mean, He sees through our eyes. He experiences with us because He feels with us. But as God looks from the perspective of eternity, what does this life really matter? I mean, does it really matter if you die at, at 10 years of age or at 100? From the perspective of eternity, I mean, is it that great a difference? I mean, it, think about what was going on in Genesis 6. You see it there, it's quoted Genesis 6, 5 in your lesson. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart, speaking of mankind, was only evil continually. The whole earth was about to be swept up in evil. The only way God could save the planet was by doing some ghastly surgery. But before he did the surgery, he gave people 120 years to repent. Now, some of you say, well, that was the problem. I mean, if you give me 120 years to do something, I'll just procrastinate. In fact, none of us have likely 120 years. I could say that with some certainty, right? But the point was, God in mercy gave everyone a chance to repent. But when people said we are going to hold on to the gangrene, if you will, of sin... God said, finally, there is no choice for humanity but to cut off all those gangrenous appendages. And it may sound terrible to the secularist who doesn't understand eternity and who doesn't understand the love of God, but it was the most loving thing God could do. It was the only way to save the planet, to save the righteous few. If he had not intervened then, the whole earth would have been swallowed up in, in wickedness. There would have been nothing to do but to recreate the earth from nothing if he was going to do it. But instead, he saved a remnant. Tuesday tells us there's more disunity and separation. We come to the Tower of Babel. And there in Genesis chapter 11, we read a very, very interesting statement. By the way, if you read Genesis 9, you'll see that God again covenants, this time with Noah. He promises him. He tells him. Actually, let's look at it. Before we go to Genesis 11, look at Genesis 9 with me. In Genesis 9, if that chapter begins, God says really that his intent for this planet has not changed. He wants people to dwell in unity. He wants the earth to share in the fullness of his love and his unity. He has now set aside a group of people who are faithful and loyal to him. And he says in, verse nine, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, God blesses Noah and his sons, and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then he goes on and he gives promises. He promises the rainbow, the sign of the covenant. But when we come to Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel, God's promises again are forgotten. What God says is not as important as what others are saying. And what your own senses are telling you. Look with me at Genesis 11. 
It says in verse 1 of Genesis 11, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass that they're there on that vast land of Shinar, there in the Mesopotamian region there, in that fertile crescent. And it says in verse 3, it says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And so they get these building materials. And in verse 4, they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You catch what's going on here? God says, scatter, scatter, replenish the whole earth. And, and, and the folks say, hey, we're all getting along well together here. We're just going to stay together. In fact, we're going to build something that goes to the heavens. The implication is that they didn't trust God's promise that he'd never send a flood either. And so again, relying on their own wisdom, trusting in their own selves, they do what? They erect their own monuments in contrast to God's word. You know, God has to do it again. He again has to call out a remnant in the very next chapter. Genesis 12, we see the call of Abram. And it's amazing as you read through the story of Abraham, the focus there of Wednesday and then Thursday's lesson, because Abram is the progenitor, is the forefather ultimately of the Jewish nation. And what God is doing and what he's doing today is he's calling a people. Because you see, Abraham was not just the father of the Jews, he is the father of all those who have faith. We have another scripture that we're going to look at. It's found in Galatians 3, verses 7 to 9. Before we have that read for us, I just want to remind you of what Abram gave up. Look at Genesis 12 with me. Again, it's, the story is, if we want to be united to God, we have to take him at his word, even when it contradicts our senses. You see, Abram, history tells us, was living in a wonderfully affluent area, Ur of the Chaldees, amazing structures. They found them, amazing gold artifacts, amazing artistry. It was the New York City, the Paris, the the London, the Beijing, whatever your model city is today. That's what it was in the day. And Abram is called to leave, to get out of his country, and God promises to bless him and make him a blessing. This is the blessing that God pronounces on his church today. Catch it as we hear from Galatians 3, verses 7 to 9. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. What does it take to be united to God? It takes accepting the gift that he's given us, accepting his forgiveness, accepting his son, and trusting him. And that's really the essence for unity in the church. It's becoming one with Jesus, one with the Father, one with the Godhead, and then we become one with one another. And as we close again looking at Friday's lesson, I will remind you that the Sabbath was not just a symbol of creation, but it's a symbol of redemption. When the Ten Commandments are given the second time in Deuteronomy, the Sabbath, we're told to keep it because God is our Redeemer, our Deliverer. And in Isaiah 66, the Sabbath is that special time throughout eternity where we'll meet together around the throne of the King. Well, oneness in Christ. We're embarking on a study. I invite you to be with us next time as we look at Lesson 2 in our series And we do have a special offer. Don't forget that. It's available. Free offer number 857, 857, Holiness and Purity. You can get it by calling 866-STUDY-MORE, or you can text it to the information that's showing on the screen. Text that code. Get the free resource that goes along with the lesson. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week as we study together on the theme, Oneness in Christ. My parents got divorced when I was three or four, and then I was basically unchurched most of my life. 
I had a girlfriend in high school tell me that she had to break up with me because I wasn't a Christian. I thought, that's weird. I believe in God. Why would she say that? Not realizing I was living a horrible life with foul language, was mean, and other stuff. And that kind of challenged me initially. And then my dad, 9-11, woke him up, uh, that he wasn't ready to meet his Lord, though he was a, a man that I valued and knew loved me, didn't doubt that. But he just knew he needed more. So he started watching TV ministries first, uh, Baptist preachers and others, and he was kind of intrigued by what he was learning. And so when he turned me on to this, this television station, first thing that I got access to was Doug Batchelor's Most Amazing Prophecy series that he did in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And I remember when I first watched this, my background was Baptist-ish uh, of sorts. But I remember when I first watched this series, I remember thinking I've never heard that before about the state of the dead or about the Sabbath or the commandments or the rapture or other things. And I remember thinking to myself, I've never heard that before, but that's what the text says. And that kept happening. And I had this experience of just wondering like, well, what else have I believed that isn't as it is, you know? And the more I watched, the more helpful it became. But again, he kind of took a different perspective on the messages. So it was fresh to me, but I just, these things I had never heard before, and I just realized, like, there's so much stuff in the Bible that no one's talking about and that people need to know. And so I ended up in this awkward situation that some of my friends who didn't believe what I was coming to believe, I didn't know how to communicate with them. And so one of the things that helped me initially was the sabbathtruths.com website, the truthabouthell.com, and the truth about death, and some of those resource websites and amazing facts have put together that were just full of resources. If I needed an answer to something that someone brought up, there would be a 95% chance that amazing facts would have something that I could use. It makes witnessing even easier in that sense. Uh, the Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible was my first uh, real Bible that I had of, of a more trusted translation. The Bible study guides were in the back of it. They had a lot of other resources that were helpful. If you can hand a book to somebody and you can pick up a phone and call Amazing Facts, you have everything you need. And so I was just printing off stuff and handing it to people, you know, like, here's, here's what I'm coming to realize. This is true. It's in the Bible. And it was a huge blessing to me and a real help just to kind of help me to better understand what the message was and understand it for myself and to have resources to put in the hands of other people, it was invaluable. Some time went by, I eventually went to a school of evangelism and was baptized. And then I had this amazing opportunity that after being in ministry for about five or six years, Doug Batcher was gonna be the main speaker at a youth event. And I was actually gonna be doing a seminar at this youth event. And it was just this amazing kind of full circle experience that the first person that I came in contact with in Adventism, to hear the message, to have it make sense, to be able to do ministry together with them, uh, in whatever role possible, just meant the world to me. And to be able to tell him my story and tell him thank you was invaluable. And so uh, God just gave me a precious gift in affording that opportunity, and I'll never forget that. My name is Dee. Thank you for changing my life. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With over 700,000 words contained in 66 books, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. To get biblical, straightforward answers, call into Bible Answers Live, a live nationwide call-in radio program where you can talk to Pastor Doug Batchelor and ask him your most difficult Bible questions. For times and stations in your area or to listen to answers online, visit bal.amazingfacts.org. can be more irresistible than a kitten. These guys might look cute now, but some of their ancestors have grown into man-eaters. We're here in a lion park in South Africa now where we can view these creatures in relative safety, but there's a reason they're known as the king of beasts. So what is it that people find so enchanting and frightening about lions? Is it their speed, their claws, their sharp teeth, or all of the above? might also be some of the stories about man-eating lions. Like in 1898, right here in Africa, they were building a bridge over the Sabo River in Kenya, and two brother lions terrorized the construction process, eating 135 workers. 
Did you know lions are mentioned in the Bible over a hundred times, and you can find them all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It's usually in reference to their ferocity and how dangerous they are. Of course, Samson killed a lion with his bare hands. David killed a lion. There are man-eating lions in the Bible. The way that they punish criminals was by throwing them in the lion's den. And early Christians were even fed to lions. But amazingly, as the Bible mentions not all lions are to be feared, there have been a few friendly lions in history. For example, in the 1950s, a couple, George and Margaret Westbow, who lived up at a ranch near Seattle, Washington, adopted an abandoned lion cub. They named it Little Tight because they felt sorry for it. But they discovered as they tried to feed her, she refused to eat any meat at all. They were concerned, thinking there was no hope for this little lioness to survive, and everybody told them the same. Because we know in the wild, lions survive an almost an entirely meat diet. Then someone showed the West Bows that verse in the Bible that talks about in heaven, the animals are vegetarians and the lion will eat straw like the ox. That encouraged them. And so they began to feed little Tyke a purely vegetarian diet. Not only did she survive, she thrived growing into a lion that was over 352 pounds and over 10 feet long. In fact, zoologists that examined little Tyke when she was full grown said they had never seen such a perfect specimen of a lioness in their life, a pure vegetarian. You know, when we hear incredible stories about that of little Tyke, it reminds us that God's original plan was to make a world of total peace. It describes it here in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 11, verse six, the wolf also will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child will lead them. Nothing is gonna hurt and destroy in the new heavens and the new earth that God is gonna create. Wouldn't you like to live in a kingdom where there's perfect peace, where there's no more death or killing or pain? God says that he wants you in that kingdom. The Lamb of God made it possible for you to have an encounter with the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Wouldn't you like to meet him today? Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org.